Just checking my. <laughs> well, we shared the link out with some relatives, um, and also the in-person opportunity. Yeah. I'm guessing yeah. people are gonna. We are streaming now, just so people can find the stream. So we're very excited. You might hear some of the, a little bit of the, the sounds of people coming together. We will, of course, reveal very soon. So right now you have this screen. You can enjoy this screen with Annie and Dan Eastman. But thank you, thank you. Cold. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. What kind of accordion is that called? It's a it's a baby button accordion, a concertina. A concertina. It, yeah, the official it's a concertina. name is Squeeze Box. Oh, wow. No. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's a concertina. It's it's for sea shanties and. Uh, but I'm not a sailor. So again, if you're on the stream, you're hearing random noises, but you don't see the screen yet, don't worry, we'll reveal it when we're really, really starting. But maybe from everyone else, you can kind of get some cheers from everyone, so you know that they're, come on, cheer, woo, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I know. So we're going to be starting very soon, uh, but I just want you to know if you are catching the stream, go ahead and put something in the chat, then we know that you're there, make sure the sound's good, and we're going to have a fun time. Welcome, welcome. It's Joanne, we haven't seen you forever. No. Since Salt Lake City days, right? Yeah, there's a chair here, too. Okay. Good to see you. We can pull it out. We can pull it out. There we go. Yeah. I'm tempted by that chair every time I come here. <laughs> <laughs> We'll help you get out if, if you need it. <laughs> Our challenge is that we pop up and down like jack-in-the-boxes and we need to be more sedentary yeah. right now. I can hear me okay. <laughs> can I hear you? I, mm, yeah, I can hear you. And you can hear us back there, right? So I think we're, <laughs> we're good. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. 
So just so you know, we actually have in-person people, and we also have those who are streaming, and we also have people who will be watching it after the fact. So I'm welcoming you, those who are streaming and finding it. Congratulations, <laughs> you did it. You might notice that it's a little bit different for us this day, because normally, when we've done streaming, we started streaming in 2023, but we've done house concerts for a long time. This is our 80th house concert, 80, 80th. <laughs> but it wasn't until 2023 that we started to stream it. Well, we did it, you might say the easy way. We did it through Zoom, and from Zoom, we streamed it to YouTube. Well, today's a big deal day because we're streaming using really YouTube and not Zoom at all. And we've got fancy, so if you check this out later, there will be an overlay. So it actually has our story artists here. So we have Dan and Annie Eastman. They're also known as Harvest Home. And so that overlay is on there. So the whole time you know who you're actually listening to, it has our logo on there. It has the QR code that people can scan and donate to. And then, of course, the web address, storycrossroads.org slash donate. So we're, we're trying to kind of uh, boost up and advance in, in our streaming, but you know what? There's no, you, you never actually have to boost anything when it's in person. It, you, this is just, it is the best experience for storytelling, but we do like having accessibility for people, and so we do welcome those who are streaming or watching it later. And we are going to be jumping in, but before we do that, maybe some of you are not familiar with Story Crossroads. We are a nonprofit that focuses on arts education for oral storytelling. It's year round. Our biggest event is coming up in May. So May 13th through 16th. And some of it is at the Murray City Park. Some of it's virtual. It's just a blend of things. Very, very exciting. Uh, but we also have continuous funders. And so we have Utah Humanities who help us, helps us out. The Utah Division of Arts Museums and Utah Legislature helps us out. We have a lot of donations from the Zoo Arts and Parks of Salt Lake County, also known as ZAP, which by the way, uh, this November, you'll notice that there is going to be a, a renewal for ZAP. So we get a ton of funding from ZAP. So make sure you vote yes. We love ZAP. So I'm putting a big thing on there right now. Um, and also, so many more that make a difference. And then, of course, our house concerts. We have it so people can come whether or not they donate. And that also helps. But the big thing is we want people to experience storytelling. And we want to be able to have the in-person experience, but also allow people to join in in any way that they can. So with these two, they actually probably considered themselves more musicians before storytellers, but I think from the beginning they have always been story musicians. And so they are a husband and wife team. Really fun and exciting to see a tandem team. And not only that, in storytelling and in playing instruments, they each can play three different instruments, which is pretty impressive in of itself. So without further ado, I think we need to have a big round of applause for Annie and Dan Eastman. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Well, just sit back and enjoy as we take you on a little trip along the western coast of Ireland, weaving in some tunes and tales. In May of 2011, we had something in common with Queen Elizabeth II and President Obama. We were all in Ireland in the month of May. 
And we were all worried about getting out of Ireland because, just like it's happening right now, an Iceland volcano erupted. But back then, ashes were spewn across Europe and many flights were grounded. Well, Queen Elizabeth II was there and she'd been the first monarch in 100 years, British monarch, that had gone to the Republic of Ireland for a visit. And President Obama and his wife were there to, um, because his mother has Irish ancestry, he said he was there to find out where the apostrophe dropped out of the name Obama, like O'Brien, O'Leary. Well, unlike those famous visitors, we were not on a tour on, with a big entourage. We were there just to wander the bucolic hills and, and walk past the crumbling castles, and we stayed at quaint bed and breakfasts, and we would walk by abbeys and through ancient cemeteries and along the coast. And we were there for a, a, a flanua, a music festival for four days. So we were there just soaking that all up. Oh, and I was on the maps, and Dan was driving, unless you think that it was all magic and fairy dust. Yeah, you should try driving in Ireland. <laughs> Maybe some of you have uh, gone to a place like that. I felt like I was relearning to drive again. The steering wheel is on the right-hand side of the, of the car, but that's supposed to help you drive on the left-hand side of the road. And when we talk about roads, um, they really could be narrow paths like went through your granny's garden. But sometimes there was only one lane, and so you'd have to pull over or back up to pull over so another car could get around you coming forward. When there were two lanes, there was uh, hedgerows on each side, stone walls, so, and no shoulder whatsoever, so it was, it was a bit, uh, what? Sketchy. Sketchy. White knuckle <laughs> event. Now, the, the signs were all in kilometers, and the gas, petrol, was in liters, and all the signage was in Gaelic, and e with English subtitles, and what, what was interesting more for Annie than for me was that some of these signposts would be like 12 foot high and they'd have eight to ten different <laughs> arrows going different directions and you were trying to read that signage as you were going through the intersection which sometimes they'd have a big sign like that and it was just a fork in the road so <laughs> well and the roundabouts they were something else they were huge they were like giant cinnamon rolls and sometimes there'd be a stop sign or a stoplight in the roundabout and we'd get stuck in those going round and round and round and only when we'd get spun out by centrifugal force uh, would we get out and we hoped that it would be on the road we wanted to take. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ireland's a beautiful country. As I, I'd like to see, have any of you been to Ireland? Okay. Looks, I bet if you say, does anyone want to go to Ireland, all hands would go up. <laughs> so I can feed you a bunch of Blarney and you won't know the difference, right? <laughs> well, it's, it's known as the Emerald Island. It's a small country. Because, yeah, it's an island that uh, is very green and beautiful and many nations and people have wanted to own Ireland. In 1803, Thomas Moore wrote a song called The Minstrel Boy, which speaks of the Irish need to rebel against their um, overlords. And he wrote it in such a way that it wasn't an, a band sort of song. It tells about a lad who goes off to war with his father's sword on his side, with a harp slung on his back, and he goes um, out to battle that way. And you wonder about the harp. The harp really is a symbol of everything that the Irish hold dear. You'll find it on their stamps. You'll find it on their coins. You'll even find it on a mug of Guinness. So <laughs> that's, uh, that's the sentiment there. Um, but you know, this harp thing 
I, as I was studying this song, um, I found that in the uh, 137th Psalm in the Bible, the Jews in exile had expressed this sentiment against uh, exile that I'm sure that Thomas More wove into the minstrel boy. It says, by the rivers of Babylon, we lay down and wept when we remembered the Ozion. We hung our harps upon the willow. Those that took us captive required of us mirth and a song. Sing us one of the songs of Zion. But how could we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? The war is gone in the ranks of death. You will find him, his father's sword he has girded on, and his wild harp slung behind him. Land of song, said the warrior bard, though all the world betray thee. One sword at least thy right shall guard, one faithful harp to praise thee. chain could not bring that proud soul under the harp he loved never spoke again for he tore its cords asunder and said no chain shall so leave thee thou soul of love and bravery Thy songs were made for the pure and free. They shall never sound in slavery. Now, Ireland is still, uh, let's see. It's a see. big island. It's, it's not that big. But one-fifth of it is still is owned by Britain, and that's Northern Ireland. And still it's known as the, the Orange, after William of Orange of the 1600s. And it's mostly Protestant still. And then the Republic of Ireland, the rest, is still known as the Green, mostly Catholic. So what happens if somebody from the north the orange, falls in love with somebody from the south. It's a bit of a mix-up. We're going to tell you about that. And we'd like you to sing along. The chorus you'll pick up quickly. And uh, if there's some whistlers in the audience, you can whistle along with me, OK? <laughs> We're 
Where are those whistlers? <laughs> oh, it is the biggest mix-up that you have ever seen. My father, he was orange, and my mother, she was green. My father was an old stern man, proud Protestant was he. My mother was a Catholic girl from County Cork, was she? They were married in two churches, lived happily enough. Until the day that I was born, then things got rather tough. Oh, it is the biggest mix-up that you have ever seen. My father, he was orange, and my mother, she was green. Baptized by Father Riley, I was rushed away by car to be made a little orange man, me father's shining star. I was christened David Anthony, but still in spite of that, to me father I was William, while me mother called me Pat. Oh, it is the biggest mix-up that you have ever seen. My father, he was orange, and me mother, she was green. With mother every Sunday to mass I'd proudly stroll. Then after that the Orange Lodge would try to save me soul. For both sides tried to claim me, but I was smart because I'd play the flute or play the harp depending where I was. Oh. One day me ma's relations came round to visit me Just as my father's kinfolk were all sitting down to tea We tried to smooth things over, but they all began to fight And me being strictly neutral, I bashed everyone in sight Oh, it is the biggest mix-up that you have ever seen My father, he was orange, and my mother, she was green my parents never could agree about my type of school. I simply had to teach myself, that's why I'm such a fool. They both passed on, God rest them, and left me caught between that, that awful, awful color, color problem, problem of, of the, the orange, orange and, and the green. Oh, it is the biggest mix-up that you have ever seen. My father, he was orange, and my mother, she was green. Well, we stayed in a sweet uh, bed and breakfast in the village of Quinn, and it was uh, a renovated old Royal Irish Constabulary Barracks, meaning when the Irish, when the British owned all of Ireland, it was a jail they could put the Irish in. And so, in the in. We noticed how wide the windowsills were, and there were round holes where the bars used to come up. That's quite something. So we would travel, we would uh, drive our rental car 15 minutes each way to go to the Flanua, the music festival in Ennis. Um, we did that for four days, and we just soaked it all in. It was so fun. And you know, the music festival was fun, but the highlight of that whole experience was brought about by our bed and breakfast hostess, Anita. She called over to the local pub, Malachy's, and said, hey, we got a couple of Americans here. Can they come jam with you Friday night at the session? And uh, they said, sure, bring them on. So anyway, we went over to the pub. Now, pubs are pretty family-friendly places. That, you know, they serve alcohol and all, but they also serve the best food and the best kind of restaurants in Ireland you get at the pubs. So after eating there, the music started up at 9.30 on that Friday night, and it went till 1.30 a.m., and uh, it was just a lot of fun. There were 10 people that showed up with different instruments, and there was, there was almost no overlap at all. I had brought my fiddle from America, and Annie had her mandolin, but uh, there was one other fiddle player, but there was a, 
Illin Pipes, that's kind of a bagpipe uh, affair of Ireland. And there was uh, the bazooki, uh, Greek kind of rhythm instrument like the guitar. There was a full-sized accordion. And then there was a concertina, the little baby button accordion that you see there. There was a banjo, and the banjo is really prominent in Irish music. A tin whistle. There was tin whistle, there was a wooden flute, and did we get them all? I think so. There wasn't a bow run. We were expecting the, to be, uh, the <laughs> Irish drum to be there, but it didn't appear. Anyway, we just kind of listened, and uh, when there, a lot of the tunes we didn't know at all, but when there was something familiar, we'd try and um, break in, and when, when the first kind of set was over and everybody needed to get refills on their water, soft drinks, Guinness, whatever, um, then a storyteller stood up and he told uh, some Blarney, some, some tales of Ireland and his own experience. It was a lot of fun. And then right after that, they said, you know, you Americans know some uh, fiddle tunes. Let's play some of yours. And so we, we broke out a couple of tunes, and then, then we went back to what they were playing. But it's amazing to us how much music has come from Ireland and uh, landed in America, um, and particularly in the Appalachian South. And also, the Irish who were in those hills um, of the Appalachians have gone back to Ireland and, and spread that music too. So we're going to play an example of a crossover tune. It, the first one is Irish, called Wind That Shakes the Barley. And the second one is, is squarely a, an old-timey tune from the, the South called Over the Waterfall. Over the waterfall. Okay. Now, while Dan switches instruments here, oh no, first we went to County Clare, didn't we? So then we traveled to County Clare on the West Coast, which is the heart of Irish traditional music. 
and we settled in. It was, it, well, Doolin. It was a little coastal town, just a sweet little place. Um, and we went to find a pub to go eat dinner and listen to the music. Well, we went in, in through the door, and there was this awful, <coughs> awful sound we could hear nonstop. We were kind of plugging our ears. And at the same time, Dan asked the proprietor, what's that noise? And the man said, lamb. And he said, what? It's a lamb? A lamp? What? It's a lamb. And Dan said, I I'm sorry, I don't understand you. He said, I'm speaking English, man. It's a lamb. A, a smoke a lamb. Molly's burned something in the kitchen, and the smoke a lamb went off. <laughs> Well, we got a kick out of that minor miscommunication. And as we sat down to eat, I saw this a framed sign on the wall that said, everyone who enters here brings happiness. Some by coming in and some by going out. <laughs> and we weren't sure what category we fit in at the moment. <laughs> but as we, um, as we listened for hours, um, it was just wonderful music, and we heard uh, what the musicians took a break at one point, but they were still talking, and we heard him talk about a young man that used to play there called Jamie, Jamie O'Donnell. And they said he was a, he played the fiddle, but he was terrible. He was really terrible. Like this? <laughs> yeah, like that. Okay. Like that. Um, and he made a point that they all felt happy when he yeah, had left. He was one of those who <laughs> brought happiness by going out. Well, he, they'd humor him along. They'd buy him a couple of drinks, and then they'd say, Jamie, play us a tune, and then he'd go home early, and they were very happy about that. But one night, Jamie decided to stay for the whole session until the wee hours of the morning, Saturday morning, and, and then they were worried about him getting home it was dark, it was cold, and they said, Jamie, you better take the dirt road, even though it's a bit longer, because we want you to get safely home. Your ma will be worried. Oh, Jamie dismissed that. He knew those bogs and hills like the back of his hand. He wasn't going to listen to that advice. So he started off in the dark, crossed a few stone walls, and went across through the bogs, and he did get lost. They said that he just stood there and didn't, he didn't know which way was home. But then he eventually saw a light up on a mound and he made his way toward that because um, he thought, well, somebody can at least let me come in for a minute, get warm, maybe they'll feed me something because I'm hungry. So he made his way toward the light. Well, he got up to that light and it, it was a door in the grassy knoll. And except the door was kind of fading in and out of view, and I don't know whether it's because he was a little bit tipsy or, or what, but when he could see it clear enough, he pushed through, and he found himself in this big, brightly lit room where a Kaylee was going on. Oh, there was dancing and music going, and there was food, and it was warm in there. It was fantastic. They invited him to eat and... Um, and uh, get warm, and then they saw he had a fiddle. They said, Jamie, how do, you, how do you know my name? Ah, we know you, Jamie O'Donnell. Play for us, Jamie. He began to play, and he played better. better than he had ever played. And they kept saying, Jamie, play, keep playing, don't stop, this is great. He played and played and played for hours, and then he got worried that his ma would be worried if he didn't get home before morning. So he, he stopped playing, and he looked for the door, but he couldn't find the door. He kept standing there. Then all of a sudden, he saw an arm, like, reach through the wall with no body, and it was like reaching for something. He went over and grabbed that hand, and it pulled him right out, kind of like a ghost or something. Oh, my gosh. Wow, a stranger had saved him. He got his bearings. It was 
dark, and he made his way home. But his cottage was full of cobwebs, and his ma wasn't there. And the villagers said, Ah, Jamie, you've been gone a long time. You've been gone a year and a day. Oh, I was sucked into a fairy ring. Oh, my. Well, he was reclusive for a while. And then he joined the fellas at the pub again. But boy, his fiddle playing was so much better now. Was it because he played for a year and a day? Or was there a bit of fairy magic in that fiddle still? That's what we wonder about. <laughs> um, I got to adjust this first okay. stand, and I think we're there. Oh, you got to adjust that. <laughs> got your head off. Okay, so while Dan's picking up the fiddle, this next tune, uh, we went through the town of Tomb, T A U M. And it's not tomb like a tombstone, but this is a story about Patty. Patty Fahey, we've named him. Uh, back in the 1800s, this is a, an Irish tune that's uh, got some notoriety and got some history, and it's got some blarney, and it's also got some uh, vocabulary that you might not understand. Patty goes from the town of Galway, which is on the west coast of Ireland, he passes through Mullingar, gets to Dublin, and then uh, he crosses the, the, uh, the channel there to um, Liverpool. Cross, and on cross the, the way, Holy Head, the yeah, rock there's outcropping. Yeah, there's a, a, a stone outcropping called the Holy Head. Now, Paddy is off to reap the corn, which means he's off to seek his fortune. And he's got a brand new pair of brogues. These are shoes. new shoes. Now, I think you'll catch the rest of it as oh, we go. Oh, wait. They, they have to sing. They have to sing. Yeah. So if you can count to five. One, one, two, three, three, four, four five. five. Okay. But it gets a little, comp a little more, more complicated. complicated. One, two, three, four, five. Five, hunt the, the hare and turn her down, down the rocky road and all the way to Dublin, Dublin whack the lolly raw. Let's try it again. <laughs> One, One, two, three, three four, five. five. Hunt the hare and turn her down the rocky road and all the way to Dublin, whack the lolly raw. Now okay. tell us the story. Okay. In the merry month of June, from me home I started, left the girls of tomb, nearly broken hearted, saluted father dear, kissed me darling mother, drank a drop of the cheer, me tears and grief to smother, then off to reap the corn, leave where I was born, cut a stout black thorn to banish ghosts and goblins, brand new pair of brogues, rattling o'er the dogs, frightening all the bogs on the rocky road to Dublin. One, One two, three, four, five, hunt the hare and turn her down the rocky road and all the way to Dublin, whack the lolly raw. In Molengar that night, rested loom so weary, started by daylight, me spirits bright and airy, drank a drop of the pure to keep me heart from sinking. That's the Paddy's cure whenever he's on for drinking, to see the lassie smile, laughing all the while, at me curious style, t'would make your heart a bubbling. Ask if I was hired, wages I required, till I was nearly tired of the rocky road to Dublin. One, two, three, four, five, hunt the hare and turn her down the rocky road and all the way to Dublin, whack the lolly raw. In Dublin next arrived, thought 
thought it such a pity to be so soon deprived of view of that fine city. And then I took a stroll all among the quality bundle. It was stole all in the same locality. Something crossed my mind when I looked behind. No bundle could I find upon me stick a wobbling. Quired of the rogue, told me conic brogue wasn't quite in vogue on the rocky road to Dublin. One, two, three, four, five. Hunt the hare and turn her down the rocky road and all the way to Dublin. Whack the lolly and then I got away, me spirits never failing, landed on the quay just as the ship was sailing. Captain at me roared, said that no room had he, when I'd leaped aboard a cabin found for Patty. Down among the pigs, played some jolly jigs, danced some jolly rigs, the water boundary bubbling. When crossed the holy head, wished that I were dead, or better yet, instead, on the rocky road to Dublin. One, two, three, four, five, hunt the hare and turn her down the rocky road and all the Away to Dublin, whack the lolly raw. The boys of Liverpool, when we safely landed, called myself a fool. I could no longer stand it. Blood began to boil. Temper I was losing. Poor old Aaron's Isle, they began abusing. Hurrah, my soul says I'm a shillelagh. I'll let fly the Galway boys were nigh and saw I was a hobbling with the loud hooray. Joined in the affray, we quickly cleared the way for the rocky road to Dublin. One, two, three, four, five. Hunt the hare and turn her down the rocky road and all the way to Dublin, whack the lolly raw. <laughs> that is a mouthful. Now, with those misfortunes, let's see. May those who love us, love us. And may those who don't, may God turn their hearts. And if he doesn't turn their hearts, may he turn their ankles so we'll know them by their limping. <laughs> oh, I've got an Irish curse for you. You do? Yes. May bad misfortune follow you all the days of your life and never catch up. So I think we're going to play Banish Misfortune now, aren't we? Oh, yeah. Oh, that means a fiddle. Yeah, get that fiddle out again. Put that away too soon. You can get started. I'll join in.
let's know about Google right now, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so have any of you heard of the Dingle Peninsula? Okay, we hadn't either until we got to Ireland. But we, we went to the, the Dingle Peninsula and we learned that it juts out into the Atlantic Ocean. And it's the further, furthest most place in Ireland. And anyway, to begin the story though, I have to say there was a, not a gang, but a, a troop of, of motorbiklists. German Germans. cyclists. They'd all come, <laughs> Bikers. <laughs> they've all come from Germany and they rented bikes. They didn't ride the bikes over. They rented them in Ireland and they were buzzing around. They went to all the kind of touristy places where we were going. And so we constantly heard German when we would go there and we, we talked to them and they were friendly. But we arrived in the town of Dingle and I started hearing this German again and I thought, oh, these guys have found us again. <laughs> but but then as we were going into shops and and all we saw it was not just men but it was women and children they were all speaking german and then we determined it wasn't german it was gaelic irish we were gaelic. listening to irish and we uh we we discovered um later that uh dingle is one of like three or four counties in ireland where Irish, Gaelic is the official language. So on all the signage, it's first in Gaelic and then there's little subtitles in English. <laughs> well, um, we, we looked around and uh, we're having fun in Dingle and we saw this small kind of cathedral that had some really neat looking stained glass in it. So we went up there and we, we climbed the stairs and as we were going in to see the, the chapel, there was an usher at the door that, that kind of, um, as we went into the foyer, she said, you can't come in here today. There's a wedding going on. So we were a little disappointed until we looked over to the left. There was a display on the wall that said, Salt Lake City, Utah. <laughs> and we thought, <laughs> Salt Lake City, Utah. And we wandered over and looked at it. And the Olympic rings were there, and it said 2002. 2002 Winter Olympics. And there was a photograph of Katie Curran, who was Irish, and she had run the Olympic torch from, from the, the town of Dingle all the way to the end of the peninsula, about 15 miles, and that was the last Irish run of the uh, of the torch relay there in Ireland, so we had to go all the way to Dingle to learn about Salt Lake. <laughs> well, so then we were off to the little town of Listoon Varna, and that's in County Clare. We spent a lot of time in County Clare, um, and the. The uh, population grows to over 40,000 in that county in September. And we'll tell you why in just a minute after we play The Road to Listunvarna. There must be a lot of roads to places. So we, we did the rocky road to Dublin. <laughs> now we're going to do the road to Listunvarna. <laughs>
Now, this is quite the little instrument. It's got about 30 buttons, and it's a different note whether you push it in or pull it out on every single one. So I'm having fun trying to figure it out. And this was the major souvenir we brought from Ireland. <laughs> Annie bought it in Galway. <laughs> yes, so fun. So Listun Varna is the matchmaking capital of the world in September. Um, people converge there for a whole month to socialize and to play music and uh, uh, dance. And if you're single, a single woman, that's the time to go there because that's the one time of year that you can propose to the men. <laughs> um, I corresponded a couple of times with Willie Daly, who's a traditional matchmaker there, still is plying his trade. And he, I said, Willie, wha why September? And he said, well, that's when the harvest is over and all the single bachelor farmers come to town um, looking for a rest from the harvest and for a wife. But all the young women have gone off to America or to the big cities, and so that's where us matchmakers had to come in. He, he has a leather-bound love book, <laughs> a matchmaking book. It's about four to six inches in the pictures. It, it's really thick and curled pages sticking out. And he's been doing matchmaking for over 50 years himself and done over 3,000 matches, probably more now because this was a few years ago when I corresponded with him. And before him, his father was a traditional matchmaker. His grandfather was. So that, that's why it was such a thick book. Now, Willie said that if you, and he sits in the pub all month long. People come to him. He said if you put your hands on that leather-bound book and close your eyes and think about who your true love will be, you will be in love and married within six months. And he says if you're already married, it'll bring a spark back to your love life. <laughs> He's a donkey farmer, but that's, he's, he's always been a matchmaker. I'd, I'd like to meet him in person. He sounds like a delightful person. So this next song, The Star of the County Down, is just that. It's about a bachelor farmer who comes into the, the county down, and he sees the star. It's not a star in the heavens. It's a woman, and he's smitten as soon as he sees her, and I won't give the rest of the story away, but he's in great need of a matchmaker. From Bambridge Town in the county down one morning last July From the boring green came a sweet Colleen and she smiled as she passed me by She looked so sweet from her two bare feet to the sheen of her nut brown hair Such a coaxing elf, sure I shook myself for to see I was really there from Bantry Bay up to Derry Cay and from Galway to Dublin Town No maid I've seen like the fair Colleen that I met at the county down As she onward sped, sure I scratched my head and I looked with her feeling rare And I said, says I to a passerby, who's the maid with the nut brown hair? He smiled at me and he said, says he, that's the gem of Ireland's crown. Young Rosie McCann from the banks of the band, she's the star of the county down. From Bantry Bay up to Derry Cay, from Galway to Dublin town. No maid I've seen like the fair Colleen that I met at the county down.
At the harvest fair, she'll be surely there, and I'll dress in my Sunday clothes. With my shoes shone bright and my hat tipped right for a smile from an oat bran rose. No pipe I'll smoke, no horse I'll yoke, till my plow turns rust colored brown. Till a beaming bride by my own fireside sits the star of the county down. From Bantry Bay up to Derry Cay and from Galway to Dublin town. No maid I've seen like the fair Colleen that I met at the county down. Now, let's see. When you think of Ireland, I bet you think of leprechauns and rainbows and pots of gold and looking for luck. Stuff like that. I bet you do. I see lots of shaking heads. Well, let me tell you about Brendan McGuire. Brendan McGuire was looking for his luck. Now, it's not that he had bad luck. He just didn't have luck, he thought. He would hang out on the weekends with all his other single friends, and they'd be bragging about how lucky they were. But Brennan didn't feel lucky at all. He confided in his best friend Thomas, Thomas, I just don't have any luck. And Thomas said, well, I don't know. I don't have any answer to that. Um, and then Thomas got to thinking about how they'd always been raised hearing about the wise woman of Wicklow. But they never had a need to travel over seven mountains and seven rivers to seek her out because they didn't have any really important questions until now. So Thomas said, Brandon, you ought to go seek some advice from the wise woman of Wicklow. So Brandon said, that's a great idea, Thomas. I'm going to do just that. I'm going to start tomorrow. And Thomas said, Brandon, if you're going to do that, if you're going to go ask the wise woman of Wicklow, why you have no luck? Can you ask her a question for me too? Sure, Thomas, you're my best friend. I can do that. Can you ask her what the luckiest thing that's ever going to happen to me in my life? Yeah, I can ask her that. So the next morning, Brennan started off and he traveled a month and a day. A, day. a month and a day. And he, oh, one afternoon, he rested in the shade of a lush grove of trees. And as he sat down by a stream and filled his water flask, he saw this gnarled little tree. And he was kind of staring at it, because it was the only tree that looked like that. The rest were so beautiful and tall and stately. And the tree said, And what are you looking at? <laughs> a talking tree? Oh, my. And where are you going anyway? Well, I'm going to find the wise woman of Wicklow to find out why I have no luck. Well, can you ask a question for me, too? Well, I suppose so. What's your question? Can you ask her why I'm all gnarled and bent and not tall and stately like all these other trees? Well, sure, I can ask. So he rested up, and then he was on his way, and he traveled a month and a day. And he finally came to a little cottage. It was getting dark. He rapped on the door. He wanted to ask if there was an inn nearby where he could stay. And the young woman there, oh, she was, she was pretty. She said, oh, sir, there's no, there's no inn nearby, and you don't want to be traveling on the roads in the dark. There are robbers. But if you want, I can make a bench in my kitchen where you can sleep. He said, oh, would you? That would be so nice. Thank you. So he came in. They fixed dinner together. They sat down and ate together. They talked. They looked into each other's eyes. And a spark of love was beginning. They both recognized that. He, she asked him the next morning when they fixed breakfast again, a, a meal again together, and sat and ate. Um, he found out how, how smart and clever she was. Oh, it made him love her all the more. 
she asked him where he was going. He said, oh, I'm going to the wise woman of Wicklow to ask her why I have no luck. Oh, well, could you ask her a question for me too? Sure, I could do that. I'm already going to ask her two other questions for other friends. Well, could you ask her why I'm so lonely? Well, sure, I could ask. I'll do that. Okay, bye. Bye. And off he went. He traveled a month and a day. Well, he finally found the wise woman of Wicklow way up in a cave on the last hill with her wild white hair and her piercing blue eyes. She could see through his heart and soul. She knew exactly what he was going to ask. And she said, Brennan, oh, Brennan McGuire, you have as much luck as anybody else in the world. No more, no less. You just don't see it very well. She said, this is what I can do for you. On your journey home, I'll help you see it more clearly. But you got to keep looking. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, and I've got three more questions from friends. Could you answer those too? She said yes. And then he was on his way. He traveled a month and a day. And he got back to the cottage where the beautiful, smart, clever young woman was. He knocked on the door, and she had the biggest smile when she answered. And he smiled back at her. Um, Come on in. Want to sleep on the bench in my kitchen again? Sure, if I could. Thank you. They fixed a meal together. They sat down and ate. They stared into each other's eyes. They shared their joys and sorrows, and they knew they were in love. She asked him, well, what did the wise woman of Wicklow tell you about your luck? Oh, she told me I had just as much as anybody else. I just don't see it very clearly. And she promised that she'd make it so that I could see it more clearly on the way home. Isn't that great? Oh, it is. But what about my question? Why am I so lonely? Oh, well, she said, you just need to find somebody you really like who really likes you, someone you can share your joys and sorrows with and eat meals with. And Well, I like you. Might, that, might you be that person? Oh, I like you too, but i got to go look for my luck. I just, you know, she said I'd see it more clearly, but I've got to look for my luck. I've got to keep looking, so bye, bye. And he went off, traveled a month and a day. He came to that gnarled, bent little tree. Oh, you again. Did you find the answer to your question? I did. The wise woman of Wicklow said that I have all the luck there is. I just have to see it more clearly. And so I have my eyes wide open, and I'm looking for it. Well, what did she say about my question? Oh, she said, she said that robbers years ago had buried a treasure chest of gold at your roots, and that's why you don't grow tall and straight. And if somebody would just come dig it out for you, then you'd grow healthy again. Well, might you be that person? And there's a shovel. Oh, no, I don't have time right now. I'm looking for my luck. But when someone does dig it out, you'll be, you'll, you'll be able to grow straight. Well, it's a treasure. I know, but, you know, I've got to go find my luck. And he went off. He traveled a year and a day. Well, he finally got back to his village where his best friend Thomas found his best friend Thomas. And he told Thomas all about his, his journey, about meeting the wise woman of Wicklow and meeting the beautiful young woman that he fell in love with and meeting the, the little tree who had a treasure chest buried at her roots. And <laughs> Thomas said, Brennan, what are you doing here? Why didn't you marry the girl you fell in love with? Why didn't you dig up the treasure? Thomas, I'm looking for my luck. The wise woman of Wicklow said I'd see it more clearly, but I got to keep looking. I got to keep my eyes open. So I, I got to go even now. So bye. Bye. Oh, and by the way, the answer to your question about what the greatest luck you'll have in your life is, she said it's knowing me. <laughs> <laughs> and then Thomas knew right what to do. <laughs> Thank you.
Well, should we do one more song? Yeah, we got time for another song? Okay, okay. good. What do you want to do? Whatever you want to do. <laughs> How about Homeward Bound? Okay, we'll do Homeward Bound. In the quiet, misty morning, when the moon has gone to bed, when the sparrows stop their singing and the sky is clear and red, when the summer ceased its gleaming, when the corn is past its prime, when adventure's lost its meaning, I'll be homeward bound in time. Bind me not to the pasture, chain me not to the plow. Set me free to find my calling, and I'll return to you somehow. If you find it's me you're missing, if you're hoping I'll return to your thoughts, I'll soon be listening, and in the road I'll stop and turn. Then the wind will set me racing till my journey nears its end. And the path I'll be retracing When I'm homeward bound again Bind me not to the pasture Chain me not to the plow Set me free to find my calling And I'll return to you somehow In the quiet misty morning when the moon has gone to bed, when the sparrows stop their singing, I'll be homeward bound again. Let me leave you with an Irish blessing. Because it's an Irish blessing. There are long ships, there are tall ships. There are ships that sail the sea. But the best ships are friendships. And may they always be. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. I mean, we really went on a journey with the Eastmans. And even if none of us have officially gone to Ireland, or maybe those listening, you have. We, we had quite an experience here today. So let's, let's share that. So uh, here live, applaud. But if you're on stream, emojis and things. So let's have a big round of applause for Annie and Dan Eastman. <laughs> And, and just as proof that we do actually have people streaming, I want to read some of the comments that are there. So we have uh, Kira, who is saying absolutely wonderful, wonderful being in all caps, by the way, uh, stories and music. I have Irish heritage and felt the music calling to me. The last song is one I love. Thank you, Dan and Annie. Smiles, also all in caps. And then we also have Deborah saying thank you. And uh, it sounds like she went to Dingle and best fish and chips 
anywhere. So we really appreciate that too. And then also, um, I, I'll go on the, the screen a little bit more. This, um, so that you can see those who are streaming, but those who are in person, this was uh, used to be worn by Jim Luter. And he was amazing. And really, uh, he, more, more than a hard worker and amazing board member of Story Crossroads, he was a great, great friend. And so when he passed away a few years ago, it was really, really hard because he was able to um, cheer things on. And, and so I do, I do this, especially during this time of year, because he would wear this and tell stories. And, and even for our 2020, uh, when we had to change our in-person festival and completely turn it virtual, he became a leprechaun for us and told stories as if he was one of the elves from the elves and the, sh um, and the shoemaker. And it was just really, really precious of what he um, does. And I know eventually I'll see him again and I can't wait to give him a big hug. So this is just to honor Jim Luter. If we can have a round of applause for, for Jim Luter too. <laughs> Um, and also, I learned some new tricks. So for those on stream, look, look what I'm going to be able to do. Now, those in live, you're not going to really see it. But um, I'm learning of poof, uh, just like that, I can show an image. Ta-da! So if you're streaming right now, you will see a picture of Annie and Dan Eastman. And there is a QR code. So if you can, you can donate that way. You can scan it or just simply go to storycrossroads.org slash donate. Um, but... I learn more tricks, I can change the picture. So I'm gonna change the picture to also say that there will be um, the S Summit and Festival with Story Crossroads. Oh, maybe I'm not so good yet. I'm learning, but I will try this one instead. Okay, maybe I'm, j oh, there we go, I get it now. Hey. Ah, it's okay. Well, what you can see, a little bit of me, is May 13th through 16th of 2024 is our Summit and Festival. And then with um, Nanette, um, she's going to be performing the next one. So let's see. Oh, you can see a little bit of that. Ah, okay. I'm still learning. But April 19th, 2024, 7, 8 p.m. in Highland, Utah. And then if you can't make it there on August 19th, you can join through the stream. But also you can actually uh, delve into eclipse stories. So even though we know that April, isn't it April 8th is the big day? Well, Nanette Watts is going with her family in the path of the eclipse, but there's a lot of stories throughout um, all kinds of times of, about the stars, about the eclipse and things. And so I just want to let everyone know uh, that you can enjoy more of these. So we're gonna continue the stream just for a little bit, but those of here who are in person, there is the perk of, well, refreshments. So yay, everybody, yes. So uh, we are gonna go ahead and say thank you, thank you, and make sure that you eat. You cannot leave this house until you eat. And if you are streaming, make sure you eat something. Then you feel like you're still, you know, the partaking with us. Thank you so much, everybody. You've been great.
sing along if you'd like. Oh, Danny boy, the pipes, the pipes are calling from glen to glen and down the mountainside. The summer's gone and all the flowers are dying. Tis you, tis you must go and I must bide. But come ye back when summer's in the meadow or when the valley is hushed and white with snow. Tis I'll be there in sunshine or in shadow. Oh, Danny boy, oh, Danny boy, I love you so. Now for real, everyone go eat something. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>